Today at St. James House of Prayer, we celebrate the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, and we welcome all who are here in the church, and we greet those who are with us online this morning.
us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among the things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him. What are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked, forward, they looked towards the wilderness and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 105 in unison. Mr. James will teach us the refrain. He will teach us the refrain. Today's refrain reads, remember the marvels God has done. And we will sing this after every third verse of Psalm 105. <laughs> his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, 
sing praises to him and speak of all his marvelous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord and his strength. Continually seek his face. Remember the marvels he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, O children of Jacob, his chosen. He led out his people with silver and gold. In all the tribes there was not one that stumbled. Egypt was glad of their going, because they were afraid of them. He spread out the cloud for a covering and a fire to give light to the night season. He asked the prayer, and he satisfied them with bread from heaven. He opened the rock, and water flowed, so the river ran in dry places. For God remember his holy word, and Abraham his servant. So he led forth his people with gladness, his chosen with shouts of joy. He gave his people the lands of the nation, and they took the fruit of others' toil. Then they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Hallelujah. Reading from Philippians, chapter 1, verses 21 through 30. To me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire to depart and be with Christ for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy and faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live in your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you're having the same struggle that you saw I had and hear that I still have. The word of the Lord.
Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, and at about three, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only for one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give the, to this last the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Slavery did not end all at once for the people of Israel, nor in these United States. In other words, they moved out of Egypt and they went through the Red Sea, and uh, it looked like all of that would be the land of milk and honey on the other side, but it involved many, many years of wandering in the wilderness and moving out of that time. In fact, they got to the point of complaining about it. They said, Maybe we were better off in Egypt. At least we had food to eat and began to complain to Moses. And for good reason. It was hard. And they were out there, but God rained down the manna that landed, that came like dew in the morning, and then the quails at night. And so, not the greatest diet, sort of like being banished to peanut butter and jelly for the rest of your life, but life did continue for them and they emerged from that time in Egypt, but it took so many years for things to move into a fullness of life. We've begun a book reading in our diocese, and I brought it with me this morning, by Marvin Dunn, A History of Florida Through Black Eyes. And so he brings a different perspective than the prevailing histories that have been written. And so he traces the African experience in Florida, uh, 
being displaced into Florida, but Florida was somewhat unique among the southern states in that under Spanish rule, the relationship between the Africans who were here, those who were here already, and those who were brought here during that time, and the Spanish was considerably different than it was in the southern colonies. So that there was a time early on when many slaves would escape the plantations of the South into Florida, which was a much better place than to be on the plantations of the South. And there was quite a bit of conflict. They said, well, won't you give us our slaves back? And they said, nah. And so many Africans uh, who were had been brought to the U.S. found a freedom or a measure of freedom here in Florida. And then their, the relationships between Africans and the Native Americans who are living here was considerably different than the slavery as it existed in the plantation states of the South. And so this is all documented in Marvin Dunn's book. And he's a he's one who was born and raised in Florida and carries that whole experience of his own. He saw, though, that it all turned considerably, both during the Civil War and after the Civil War, and especially during that period of Reconstruction and then the uh, years of Jim Crow laws that followed that period, and that Florida became as oppressive for the African now descendants as it had been anywhere. Many of the incidents and uh, the recounting of, uh, you know, lynchings and extrajudicial activities that went on during that time, found out Morris Kennedy reported on them in real time in his newspaper writing. And so um, much of this is very close to our own time. And so that there is much in the middle of this book which takes us down into the most troubled history of life in Florida. And we are slowly emerging perhaps from some of those times, but at the same time there's real pressure to not recount the history of African Americans in Florida and pressure to, um, to not teach. And so um, we need to do that. So we're having a diocesan book read. And um, I think Leela and I have been in a contest to see who he's, and I got, I won. <laughs> I read the entire book. So I have done it and it, it's a lot. But one of the things, one person who is mentioned in here, but he only is mentioned in a photo caption, but is mentioned for his bravery in uh, bringing about black voting in Florida was none other than the Reverend John E. Colmer, who is always hanging in the parish hall until this morning, which I brought him in. <laughs> and John Colmer is our Union of Black Episcopalians chapter, is named for him. And he was the vicar of St. James Church from 1919 until 1929. 
He was, for the time, he was brought inside in the Episcopal Church, being ordained, trained and ordained at a fairly young age, unlike that very slow process for the first ones who were ordained. But of course, he couldn't go to the regular white seminary. He went to the Bishop Payne School, which was the black Episcopal seminary. But there was a black Episcopal seminary. So we look, these, these histories become very complex and nuanced, and there's not much simplicity or directness into how all of these things took place, which is what I have enjoyed and appreciated about this book. So John Comer was born in the Bahamas, gives him those island roots that we know about here, but came to Miami, and that's where he was brought up. But after seminary, he was sent to Tampa, and it was the old South Florida Diocese. We are now Southeast, Southwest, and Central Florida, but that was the old South Florida Diocese. One huge diocese, always had problems gathering for convention, so they had to pay the clergy generously for their mileage because it was a big deal to drive all the way over this state to get to the convention. But um, I don't know whether they sent him out of town to be a young priest somewhere else for a while or what the plan was. Sometimes that's a good plan. You go make your mistakes somewhere out of town. But he came to Tampa and served 10 years as the vicar of St. James, during which time the building down on India Street, which is now Ray Charles Avenue, all the streets have been realigned. But if you haven't been down there to see it, it's not far from here at all, but it's sitting in the middle of brand new apartments and featured in, the, in, a, in an island in the street there right across from Perry Harvey Park. And the building has been fully restored now as part of the Museum of um, Tampa History Museum. But he, uh, his work in Tampa was so effective that there was great protests, outcries, and letter writing that he should not be moved to Miami. But after a 10-year period, uh, I don't know how it worked in those days, I think the bishop was a little more direct and powerful in those days, so I think he probably got sent to Miami. But uh, he was missed greatly here in Tampa, having served from the age of 28 years old to 38 years old. So here is a young man, and as you can see, he is a very handsome young man in the photo that we have. And. Um, the archives of the Episcopal Church have records on him, and uh, here he is. You can't see it too well, but he's, he does look more whatever his age was. He's older. But he operated kind of on the inside, in that if we're going to look back at this time of Moses, it's like either the they made it out of Egypt with great drama, but then there was 40 years of slogging around in the wilderness, and perhaps that might more describe um, the times of John Calmer, where he worked in so many ways to have that kind of movement forward of taking things which had been accomplished in principle but not in fact and bringing them more into reality. So though he was ordained, I'm sure he met with different kinds of resistance, but he had to pressure for things which did take place. 
Things like the church camps became desegregated. And the life of the church became desegregated during these time periods. Things like um, movements of southern bishops to create um, a separate diocese for black people. Those, those well, I, I doubt that happened earlier, but there was those kinds of pressures that were taking place all the time and he was a continuous advocate and organizing to move things in the direction that they should go. And so he's recorded in Marvin Dunn's book as during the time he was in Miami. In 1939, there was an election in Miami and during the campaign, the Ku Klux Klan had hung a dummy. It looks like in this picture, it's uh, adjacent to a telephone pole, but to, designed to look like a lynching scene. And they burned this effigy in the black part of town to discourage blacks from voting. And it says in the caption here, the intimidation backfired, led by Sam Solomon and Father John Comer. Blacks voted in record numbers in the election. This is only mentioned in the book, but he's there. But there's something about this that I think is a, a deeper lesson for us all, in that many names will come to the fore and any time a history is written there will be the ones who died tragically the ones who were killed unjustly and the um, torture and pain that went on those names will come up but that underneath all of that are the folks who work and work and work to bring about the justice, the reconciliation, and the future in the ways that take the achievements that have been made in principle and then bring them about in fact. And John Comer, as I read of his history and the positions he held and the things he worked on, he was one of those who brought it about in fact. He served here, St. James, 10 years. He went to what is now Southeast Florida to Miami and was involved in the founding of a St. Agnes Church in Miami. It was already established, but uh, there was a foundation laid for the church, but during his time there, it was built up, and that parish grew to, um, I'll find it here, I think it's, it's something over 2,000 members. He presented 3,000 people for confirmation, um, grew to 2,300 congregants in the 1940s, thus making it the largest Episcopal Church of Color in the South and the third largest for Afro-Americans in the country. From 1944 to 63, Calmer also served sim simultaneously as the rector of St. Agnes and as the archdeacon of the Diocese of South Florida, which meant he was the bishop's right-hand person. You know, okay. And as Episcopalians, we find ourselves sometimes on the right side of history, sometimes on the wrong side, and sometimes on both sides at the same time. And, well, we had Alexander Crummel of first week few weeks ago on our UBE Sunday, 
But this is UBE Sunday part two. <laughs> because I found myself saying, we must spend some time talking about John Comer. Because he's one who may only get brief mention in some circles because he pretty much worked within, but he took what the, the accomplishments that were made in principle and worked to bring them about in fact. And that's where most of us find ourselves. And so I want us to hear that witness of John Palmer, who maybe spent 40 years in that wilderness, but bringing about the freedom, the reconciliation, and answering the calling that was there to be lived into all the more and realized. In the archives of the Episcopal Church, his write-up includes that John Edwin Comer is remembered as one of the chief architects of an integrated Episcopal Church. And so he led that way. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, but one being with the Father, through him all things were made. Salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy 
Dorothy Batson, Ivy Martin, Fred Keen, Gina Norris, Dolores Thomas, Mac Alexander, Margie Jefferson, Ruby Lockhart, Eleanor Solomon, Stella Jacob, Ernest Reese, Rich Burnell, Doug Warren, Deborah Blanchett, Kristen Scotland Stanley, and Warren Dunn. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name, bring offerings and come into his court.
as we continue our worship at the altar, uh, we understand that uh, our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, just uh, just completed a some surgery, and so he's just out of surgery, and so we wish to hold him up in prayer, and uh, let us pray. Oh God, we ask you to watch over your beloved servant and our presiding bishop, Michael Curry. We ask that you call him into wholeness of body, mind, and spirit, and bless him as we are grateful for his presence as a gift to us. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and that the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. 
And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing. Hallelujah, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Amen. 